All right, it is 1.30, so we'll go ahead and get started with today's colloquia. So our colloquia today is going to be given by Will Armitrap, who is our local postdoc. He did his undergrad at the Westminster College in Pennsylvania, uh, where he got his bachelor's of science um, back in 2012. After graduating from the college, he went to uh, West Virginia University, where he got his master's of science in 2014. And then he defended his PhD thesis in 2018, and has been at the Green Bank Observatory as a postdoc for the past year. So please join me in welcoming Will. Thank you all for coming out this afternoon. Now, many of you have heard bits and pieces of my research before, largely built on the back of the GBT, but I don't know that anyone has seen the full arc of the research yet, so I'm happy to be able to talk with you about that today. Now, as a teaser, we do have some GBT data up on this title slide here using the Argus receiver to look at molecular gas in the far outskirts of the Milky Way. So that's sort of where we're building up through um, in this talk, but we will start at large scale views of how people have tried to understand the structure of the galaxy for the past 400 years, right up to how we're trying to do it today with instruments like the GBT. Uh, so some of my collaborators are pointed on this room, including Dave, who has uh, been very helpful with all of the Argus work, and my advisor at WVU, Lauren Anderson. Here's a little bit of what our journey will be today. So introduction to what H2 regions are and galactic structure as they are able to probe through some of our current work on Milky Way star formation, eventually building up to these studies of molecular gas and a few pitches for what could be my work over the next five plus years using the GBT and other instruments. So before we go into these objects called H2 regions, I wanted to point out the first map of the Milky Way. So this was made by another William, a fellow named William Herschel, back in 1785 using optical star counts. So what Herschel would do on his huge refractor telescope was go out and look at different points of the sky, and just count up how many stars he could see in that direction. He assumed if he counted up more stars, that the galaxy went further in that direction. And so something like in this direction, there were a lot of stars, and so he assumed that it went further in that direction. A problem is here that he was using optical light and optical stars to try to trace galactic structure. And being here in Green Bank, we know that really optical light is very affected by interstellar gas and dust. And so he was really just getting a very local view of what the Milky Way looks like. Any estimates of what this feature here is, this big dark patch? in his map, there was a dust lane, actually. So there was dust passing in front of these stars that was blocking light, so his idea was, okay, it must not go out that far in that direction. Had he had a radio telescope, he could have seen straight through that and been able to probe further away structures in the Milky Way. To me, this sort of looks like an amoeba or a duck bill. <laughs> So people have been thinking about what the structure of our galaxy is for hundreds of years. And this is still, to some extent, an unsolved problem. We're still able to refine galactic structural details to this day. One of the main tracers for this is a class of objects called H2 regions. H here stands for hydrogen. 2 stands for singly ionized. So hydrogen has one proton and one electron. If you pop that electron off, you have singly ionized that hydrogen. And these H2 regions surround very high mass stars, something like 10 times to 100 times the mass of the sun. These high mass stars shoot out a lot of very hard radiation, very high energy photons, and that's what's able to do this ionization of the interstellar H1 surrounding the stars. Now these are so luminous that they can be seen across the entire galactic disk from mid-infrared wavelengths through radio, so they're some of the brightest objects we have to trace out different areas in the Milky Way. We also typically say that H2 regions are zero-age objects compared to the Milky Way. Galaxies live for sort of tens of billions of years. These high-mass stars only live for on order of tens of millions of years. The higher-mass star you get, the shorter its lifetime is. 
And so if you're tracing an object that is created by one of these high mass stars, it's not going to live for very long, and you can say that that star formation is pinned to essentially this epoch of time. So they don't live for very long, they're tracing the state of the galaxy as it is approximately right now. Many of these star formation regions also have associated molecular gas with them. Molecular gas really is the fuel for star formation. It's what contributes to building stars. And so many of these regions have relics of that fuel left around that are actively contributing to star formation in the regions. <clears throat> What's some of the expected emission that we should get from H2 regions? Well, here are some radio species. And the first one that we'll talk about is called thermal bremsstrahlung. Bremsstrahlung is German for breaking. Uh, this is what we call our free-free continuum, and it's pretty much just from that sea of protons and electrons out there. So you have positive protons, a sea of electrons, and if you accelerate a charge, you will emit a photon. So what happens for thermal free-free continuum is that you accelerate our electrons around protons, and they emit photons. You have this continuum of emission, and so that's what we're seeing through this free-free continuum. It's basically the glow of the plasma. Since there you're tracing the ionizing, um, or you're tracing the plasma itself, you can actually pull this back and say something about the number of photons that are going into maintaining that H2 region, the number of ionizing photons. Now, if you have more ionizing photons, you might expect that you also have higher mass stars or more high mass stars in the region. And so we can go from number of ionizing photons to effectively the mass of the stars that are creating those ionizing photons. Another species that we use to trace H2 regions are called recombination lines. In the optical, the most common recombination line is known as H alpha. This is a transition of the third energy level of hydrogen down to the second. So I've talked a little bit about this C or this soup of electrons and protons in these H2 regions. The electrons want to be back with the protons. And so as they try to recombine with the protons, they will hit about every energy level on the way down, emitting a photon each time. In the optical, this glows at 656 nanometers for H alpha. In the radio, we're looking at much higher level transitions. So instead of the third to the second state, we might be looking at the 93rd to the 92nd state of hydrogen. And so these are pretty low energy, but because they are at radio wavelengths, we can see them across the entire galaxy. One thing that we can pull from recombination lines is an estimate of the distance to a region um, this is because these recombination lines are at very specific frequencies, and if an H2 region is moving towards us, it will be blue shifted. If it's moving away from us, it will be red shifted, so you can determine that shift in the line. And based on a model of how the galaxy rotates, you can estimate how far away that region is, uh, based on how much it shifts. <coughs> you can also get an estimate for the metallicity of regions, and in astronomy we basically call everything that is larger than helium, a metal, um, because those are all things that are created through stellar death, basically. Stars produce all elements that are heavier than helium, and so if you can trace the metallicity, you can start to get an idea of how many generations of star formation have happened in a neighborhood of the galaxy. The last bit of expected radio emission that we'll talk about is molecular emission. And here, there are many, many, many species. For instance, carbon dioxide or carbon monoxide is often used as a tracer of molecular gas. But with the GBT at its highest frequencies, uh, we can look at carbon monoxide, we can look at HCN. These are some classical tracers for the total molecular envelope that is going into producing stars. So if you have a very high line strength, you turn that into a very high mass of molecular gas associated with that star forming region. Most of the recent surveys of high mass star formation 
really in the past decade or so have focused on some of the earliest phases of star formation. A lot of these are good targets for, say, ALMA, but here with the GBT, we've mostly been looking at evolved star forming regions. So these earlier phases are something like um, the RAMP survey is looking at ammonia, which is tracing some earlier phases of star formation. The RMS survey, Atlas Gal, um, these are all looking at shortly after the stars have been born. To date, though, we've cataloged on order 2200 galactic H2 regions. But surveys of other galaxies suggest that these surveys really are not very complete yet. For instance, if we look at M74, which has a lower star formation rate than the Milky Way, we have double the number of detected H2 regions. So it's forming stars at a slower rate, but yet we have more candidates for star formation in that galaxy than we have in our own Milky Way. This indicates really that our catalogs are just deficient, that we are not yet as complete as we should be for our Milky Way census. So where are these missing H2 regions? That's sort of the backdrop for most of my work to date. Moving directly then into some of our ongoing surveys. So we've cataloged a um, large number of candidate and known H2 regions through what's called the WISE catalog of galactic H2 regions. We have 2,200 known H2 regions and another 6,000 or so candidates. These all look the same at infrared wavelengths. So this is a panel of images from the WISE satellite. WISE was put up by NASA in 2009. And every single one of these H2 regions has a, about the same characteristic infrared morphology. So they have this 22 micron core, which is shown in red. That's tracing the hot dust at the centers of these H2 regions and really is tracing the high mass stars themselves. In green surrounding them, in 22 microns, we have this more diffuse 22 micron envelope. That's tracing what we call PAW emission, or polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. And that's effectively the boundary between the H2 region and the ambient interstellar medium. So these PAWs have been looked at, associated with H2 regions for a while, just as an aside, None of them have ever been detected individually until very recently with the GBT. Uh, this is some work that the astrochemistry groups have been working on. And you also can find paws on stakes that you char in your grill. So basically it's uh, sort of that burnt bits on, on your stake and you, you really get it from evolved stars that are spitting dust out into the interstellar medium. So this is also why char marks can be carcinogenic, uh, because paws themselves are pretty carcinogenic. Uh, so as an aside, uh, don't eat a paw, I guess. Once we determine all of these candidates in the infrared, we'll then confirm with radio through many of those species that we talked about a couple slides ago, and largely uh, with the Green Bank Telescope. My early work in graduate school was working on what was called the H2 Region Discovery Survey, which used that large catalog and tuned to many of the candidates that we had trying to determine if they were bona fide H2 regions through that recombination line emission. So this is the piece of the sky that we can see with the GBT. The sun is here, galactic center is there, so we can probe a little bit beyond the galactic center and then through much of the outer galaxy. As I mentioned, most of this work was done with the GBT, but we also used Arecibo for a bit of it. And through this first survey, we detected 787 new H2 regions in the northern sky. The survey before this that had done the bulk of the work actually was done by Jay and some people here on site using the 140 foot, where he had doubled the known census of H2 regions with the 140 foot, we again doubled it with the GBT. One thing to point out here is that there is a large section of the sky that we just can't access here in the north. And so moving forward, we have some other surveys to make up that completeness. So our aim here really is to complete this entire census of galactic H2 regions so that we can start to probe a few different interesting questions. One, what is the total luminosity 
of the Milky Way. If you add up all of the photons, what is its luminosity? How does that compare to other galaxies that we can study? What is the H2 region luminosity function? That is, how do luminosities change as you go from large H2 regions to small ones? We can also look at the high mass star formation rate, that is, how quickly stars are being produced in the Milky Way, and in particular in different parts of the Milky Way, and look at star forming efficiency. How easily do we turn molecular gas into current generations of stars? And probably the most easy to visualize would be how do we probe galactic structural details with these H2 regions? High mass stars are born really preferentially in spiral arms. And since we talked about them not living for very long, they don't have time to migrate out of those galactic structures before they die. So if we detect over densities of H2 regions, we can say that we're using those to trace out really the spiral structure or other structures in the Milky Way. Here is a view of what the Milky Way would look like if we zoomed above it and looked down. This is including all of our H2 region surveys up until about 2018. So the sun is in this red dot. The galactic center would be right there. And you can see that there are areas of the sky where we're not certain of distances, for instance. We don't assign any distances really in this direction. And you can see that the fourth quadrant that you can only see from the south really is not as complete as our more northern surveys. I'll ask you to squint a little bit and maybe you can start to make out some spiral structure here. It's a little bit tenuous, but as we start to improve our surveys across the galaxy, we're hoping that more of those structures pop out. Really turning an image like this into one of the more beautiful images of spiral structure that you expect whenever you think about what the Milky Way might look like. I won't talk much about this in here, but this is some population synthesis work that I've been working on. Basically, we've made a model of the Milky Way, including what structures we expect to be there and the distribution of H2 regions across the galaxy so that we can estimate the total number of star-forming regions in the Milky Way. Some regions where we have current ongoing extensions of the H2 region discovery survey include, there's a new survey in the south using the Australia Telescope Compact Array. This is a six element interferometer in Narrabri, Australia, which is a couple hours northwest of Sydney. With this survey, we've already published 200 new H2 regions in the south, and we have another catalog coming out, hopefully this year, or next year rather, of the fainter sources. So we've detected on order 500 new H2 regions in the south, really bringing our completeness limits closer to those of our more northern surveys. I submitted a paper just last week looking at some of the faintest catalogs of, or faintest candidates of H2 regions in the Milky Way. This is using VLA data, trying to see if the objects that had no known radio continuum with them uh, we could detect continuum with more pointed observations with the VLA. And the idea here is, again, to try to estimate the total population of galactic star formation regions. But what we will really get into right now are some of the most distant galactic H2 regions in the Milky Way in a structure called the Outer Scutum Centaurus Arm. Just to get your bearings, again, the sun is here, and the Outer Scutum Centaurus Arm traces out the outermost reaches of the Milky Way in the first galactic quadrant. Much of this work has been done with the GBT, but also some has been done with Gemini North in Hawaii and the VLA and the Arizona Radio Observatory. So we really have a, a cadre of telescopes for some complementary projects looking at molecular gas and H-alpha emission and radio continuum from these objects. So moving then into our Argus observations, or our Outer Scutum Centaurus arm observations. This really appears to be the boundary for high mass star formation within the Milky Way. Well, one more time, here's the sun. Here's a cartoon of what galactic structure could look like. So we have the galactic bar here and the galactic center. The OSC appears to be an extension of the Scutum Centaurus arm 
out into the outer first quadrant. And it's the most distant known molecular spiral arm from the sun. We know of some H1 that's a bit further out than this, but this appears to be the most distant molecular emission in the Milky Way galaxy. It wasn't discovered until 2011 by Tom Dame and Pat Thaddeus, uh, Pat who was Ron's advisor in graduate school. And the reason it wasn't discovered until then was because it is so far from the center of the galaxy that it actually warps above the galactic plane. So with this dotted line, we have the galactic midplane, and in grayscale, we have H1 emission that is integrated along the expected distance of that distant spiral arm. So you can see out at 70 degrees galactic longitude, this arm lies something like four, four and a half degrees above the galactic plane. The reason this is important is because most surveys of the Milky Way galaxy, they don't want to waste telescope time, so they just look at plus or minus a degree or so. So if this arm lies four degrees above the plane and you're only looking at plus or minus a degree, you will not be looking where this distant star formation is. In blue here, I've put down all of our targets from the WISE catalog of H2 regions that are coincident with the H1 emission plus some that have known very distant distances that we then followed up with the GBT and VLA. On this panel, we are looking into the galactic midplane. So we are in the Milky Way galaxy looking at the midplane. On the next screen, I just wanted to prime you. It's like we're flying above and looking down on the arm. So we'll again see that H1 emission, but from a different viewpoint. So here we are. We have that integrated H1 emission. And you can see that we are detecting many, many very high mass objects out at huge distances from the sun. So we have 17 detected outer Scutum Centaurus arm H2 regions, and the red targets are from a paper a couple years ago, again using GBT and VLA data. These have the largest heliocentric radii of any star forming complexes in the Milky Way, and they represent stellar types as early as 04 or so. So an 04 star is 60 times the mass of the sun. So even in this very distant galactic environment, we are seeing huge amounts of high mass star formation. If there are any questions throughout, please let me know too. But what might we expect from some star formation in very distant environments like this? Well, star formation in the outer galaxy could be, I'm gonna posit that it could be more similar to that of a much younger Milky Way where you hadn't had large amounts of star formation already happening, or it could be similar to that of star formation in lower metallicity galaxies like the Large Magellanic Cloud. So out in the OSC, we have lower gas densities. We have lower metallicity environments. Uh, I'm pointing to a paper by Dana Balser here where he traced the metallicity of H2 regions as you move out from the center of the galaxy. And there's this nice gradient, uh, pretty linear actually, where it peaks at the galactic center, and at the distance of the OSC, metallicity is about 8.3 in this 12 plus log over H metric. 8.3 is about the metallicity of the Large Magellanic Cloud, too. So the idea here is that towards the center of the Milky Way and of other spiral type galaxies, you've had many more generations of star formation. There's just more star formation activity happening. Stars produce metals, which are then reprocessed by new generations of stars. And so it makes sense that the metallicity would drop off as you move out from the center of a galaxy. Our observing plan for this work was to map all of the thermal continuum and molecular gas from OSC H2 regions. Thermal continuum actually was done with VLA and the molecular gas with the GBT in order to characterize the total envelopes of molecular gas that went into producing these generations of stars and try to understand something about radial trends in the Milky Way. So this work is still ongoing, but one of our hopes is that we can start to constrain the efficiency of star formation at different 
areas of the galaxy? How is it different in the solar neighborhood versus the galactic center versus these very distant reaches of the Milky Way? This is exactly a slide that I um, have used in a couple talks this year to try to advertise the Argus Array and some of the great science we can get. So we are all much more familiar with Argus than most people at conferences that Natalie and I would be chatting with. But the Argus Array operates from 74 through 116 gigahertz. It has some important molecular lines in that region. And on the right side here, I have an example map from our observations where we tune to 13CO and also HCN and HCO+. HCN and HCO plus are tracing more of the dense gas, whereas 13CO is more diffuse gas. So from our objects, we detected the majority of them in 13CO. So the majority of these H2 regions still have lingering molecular gas associated with them. And then with the first round of dense gas tracers, we detected all of our objects to have that dense gas component from HCN and HCO plus. On this slide, I show not just the 13CO, but all of the tracers that we have. So there are three different sources shown on this slide. Each source is reproduced twice so that I didn't have many, many levels of contours shown. So on the top, we have VLA data shown in this white or gray contours, 13CO in green, HCN in yellow, and HCO plus in red. So for this, I want to point out that we are seeing very high amounts of molecular gas, large masses of molecular gas reservoirs still attached to these H2 regions, up to say 10 to the 6 solar masses of total molecular gas. Of the dense component, we also have a lot of dense gas associated with them, something like up to 10 to the 5 solar masses of dense gas attached to these. So these are fairly large clouds associated with the H2 regions. And if we just take a ratio of the masses, the dense gas to total molecular gas ratios tend to be around 5%, which we'll see in another slide, is about what we would expect. So it's pointing out all of those. One other thing that I want to point out, if we're on here, is that it's not uncommon to see offsets between, say, the thermal continuum and the molecular gas. You could expect that once star formation turns on, there's a lot of radiation being pumped out of these H2 regions from the high mass stars, and it can, to some extent, excavate the diffuse molecular gas. So you, you might expect the thermal continuum and molecular gas to be offset a bit. Here are three new sources uh, that we're looking at. Again, same breakdown where the top row is VLA and CO. And this source is pretty similar to what we saw on the previous page, dense gas ratio of about 5%. But we'll see that for these two sources, we have much higher dense gas to total molecular gas ratios. Turns out that these two objects are our most actively star-forming regions. Oops. And so if we look at sort of the median value of the dense gas, it's all around 5%. These two, on the next slide we'll see, are really very actively star-forming. They have high infrared luminosities. But if we just look at the 5% ones for now, some galactic surveys have suggested that that's about right for an average molecular cloud in the Milky Way. Uh, Batiste and Heyer found the typical dense gas fraction to be 7% for Milky Way clouds, and some studies of external galaxies saw that this dense gas fraction continues to decrease as you move further out from the center of the galaxy. So moving from 7% for an average cloud to 5% for a very distant outer cloud seems about right, but this is still a small sample, small number of statistics. On this axis now, we still have dense gas fraction for both of these plots, but on this plot we're looking at the stellar masses in these regions. And on this plot, we're looking at the infrared luminosity 
or you could say we're looking at the star formation rate. So you can see that the objects that really do not lie on this 5% dense gas ratio tend to be the very most massive uh, stellar components and highest infrared luminosity, highest star formation. Why is this? Uh, well, I posit that the ionizing sources in these most active regions could be stripping away the diffuse molecular gas clouds, leaving some of those dense gas cores still intact. Another reason, which is seen in ultraluminous galaxies, is that that dense gas might not actually be tracing the dense gas, it might be excited by the very high energy photons being emitted from these regions. Um, so you're selectively heating the HCN and not the 13CO that's tracing the more diffuse molecular gas. This has been seen, like I said, in other galaxies, but to my knowledge, hasn't been seen in discrete clouds in the Milky Way. Here's sort of a classical plot of star formation rate versus the mass of clouds, where up here, we have different types of galaxies. So these are high mass and also, or rather high mass and highly star forming. So these are entire galaxies. Whereas down here we have typical galactic clouds and our survey um, agrees fairly well with these galactic clouds. <clears throat> Keep in mind that we are looking at very distant objects and so we are probably also biased towards detecting slightly higher mass clouds anyways out there just because lower mass clouds might be medieval our sensitivity limits. So that's my way to explain why there's this slight offset in the mass part of the plot. Now, to wrap up what we've talked about for this distant outer galaxy sample, star formation in the outer galaxy could be uh, more similar to that of star formation in an earlier Milky Way or lower metallicity galaxies. It's also a good pattern for star formation on the outskirts of other galaxies, where things start to get very, very faint. And if you're looking at galaxies outside of the Milky Way, it's easier to map the interior regions of the galaxy than the lower star formation bits on the far outskirts. The OSC has been shown to have stellar types as early as 04, again, 60 times the mass of the sun, and pretty large compact areas of molecular gas. And again, we see this interesting trend where the dense gas ratio seems to be sitting at 5%, except for the most actively star forming regions. So some future work here include trying to compare this to a representative inner galaxy sample, and potentially in the future, looking at more of our OSC targets with Argus dense gas observations. That takes me to the end of the Argus observations section. I've gone a little bit fast through, through that, but that means that we have a lot of time for questions, and I'll spend a little bit longer on what could be some future work with the GBT and some existing data. So one bit that I haven't talked at all about is that Natalie and I, and Charles also, are involved with this Mustang II Galactic Plane Survey. It's called MGPS-90 for short, because MGPS was already taken as a survey name. And through this survey, we're trying to understand the population of the earliest phases of high mass star formation. So we really expect there to be hundreds of new detections of hypercompact H2 regions that will pop out as little knots in the Mustang data. So just to run you through what you're looking at here, this is a Mustang field of the galactic center. And on the far left, we have Atlas Gal. On the far right, we have a VLA plane survey, galactic plane survey, excuse me, at 20 centimeters. So this is L-band. And combining Mustang data with data from Atlas Gal or the VLA, we're able to pull out different species of gas that we're tracing. So if you scale this 20 centimeter emission up to the expected intensity 
at Argus or at Mustang frequencies and subtract this from the three millimeter, and you pop out and have a dust map. If you do the same thing where you subtract this from the Mustang data, you have a map of the free free continuum. So Mustang is an awesome instrument, not only for detecting the SZ effect in distant galaxy clusters, but trying to make dust maps and free free maps of the galactic plane. So this is a pilot project. There's a paper being published by Adam Ginsberg hopefully next year as the pilot data from this. Um, and it is active in the proposal system, I believe. Another possible pitch for future work involves characterizing the molecular outer disks of star formation regions in nearby galaxies. So this would be using Argus 144, I'm saying. We could also use Argus current generation, but it would be a significant investment in time. So with the Degas project, you can see on the right side, uh, this is a project being led by Amanda Kepley that Dave has been involved in. And they are mapping the interior two by two arc minutes of many external galaxies to try to look at the molecular gas distribution among those galaxies. You can see in general, two by two arc minutes for these near galaxy sources is not really tracing the outskirts of the disk, so you're getting great information of what's in the interior regions of the galaxies, but not really anything beyond that. So I think there are some natural collaborations to be built with extragalactic astronomers, not just using GBT data, but there are very similar surveys using ALMA and the 30 meter telescope at IRAM that are all kind of looking at the same things, but with lower sensitivity in general than the GBT at these frequencies. So the collaboration with the Degas survey would be mostly in extending that survey and collaboration with the other uh, PIs, for instance, Frank Begeel working on the Empire survey with IRAM would be deeper looks also to higher or larger extents in their samples. Some work that is using existing data uh, includes estimating the total number of galactic H2 regions through some population synthesis modeling. We gave a little teaser for this earlier, uh, but we built a Milky Way model, including galactic structure, and all of the knowledge we have from current generations of H2 region surveys with the GBT and other telescopes. And the punchline here is that from these population synthesis models, we expect that the Milky Way has about 10,000 galactic H2 regions. Up until this point, we've confirmed about 2,200 of those, largely the brightest 2,200. And so as we're pushing to lower and lower um, luminosities, we might be able to pick off more of those. I think it's, it's probably not in the cards to have a, another HRDS where we're looking at thousands of candidates but just being able to characterize what the total population should be is a valuable contribution, I think, to the star formation community. Using these surveys again, uh, I have a new collaboration with Alyssa Goodman at Harvard and some, some folks in Heidelberg trying to combine what we know about molecular clouds distributed across the Milky Way with current generations of star formation. So we're trying to compare the spatial coincidence of star forming regions and giant molecular clouds. They don't always necessarily trace the same structures, it turns out. As you zoom out on a galaxy and have really coarse resolution, they seem to trace each other very well, but whenever you start to zoom in further and further and further, they separate into more discrete areas, whereas you might have star formation sort of in one part of the spiral arm, you might have molecular gas that is trailing or leading that star formation. So this has been done in other galaxies, uh, including a paper by Melanie Chavantz just last month, but not yet in the Milky Way. And it has implications for how we understand molecular cloud lifetimes, star formation in different galactic environments, and um, 
again, I think would be a, a valuable complement to some extragalactic surveys, but in our home galaxy, the Milky Way. So that's my story. Uh, up until this point, I have told you that the H2 Region Discovery Survey has more than doubled the number of known H2 regions across the Milky Way galaxy, mostly with the GBT, and that recent work suggests there are about 10,000 total star-forming regions within our galaxy, high-mass star-forming regions in our galaxy. Also, that Argus allows us to easily map the molecular gas associated with evolved star-forming regions across the entire Milky Way. Here are the future work bits that I've talked about in these last couple slides. And on the right, I think that's the first picture that I took with the GBT back in 2014. Uh, film camera. Here's the most recent picture I took with the GBT, <laughs> just two days ago. And I will happily take any questions you might have. Thank you. I was curious on the two clouds that showed the higher HC and the yeah. HCO uh, ratios, basically. Um, have you, well, what did HCO plus show? It showed about the same thing. So it also showed the It was also higher. Um, for one of those clouds, HCO plus had a higher intensity than HCN, and the other was flipped. But they were about. But in terms of, so they showed a high HCO plus to CO ratio too. That yes. Point. That's right. At this point, sort of towards the denser gas and not just purely a red pumping scenario. So. Yeah. Where you're. Yeah, truly have higher densities. Higher density. Yeah, it might be worth taking a few spectrum of some other dense, dense tracers to just study those. That's really interesting. Those two, I believe, had some interesting velocity structures, too. Okay. Yeah, where there looked like there could be multiple components there. But in, in both of the species. Oh, okay. Any other questions? When you're dealing with the outer cloud, outer galaxy clouds, um, are you having resolution problems? Are, you, um, are some of these sources are smaller than your, your uh, resolution on the GBT, or do you have to correct for those kinds of, of, uh, of factors? So with our I know the reasons that you, the four regions you show show look like they're extended enough to get. Yeah. So. The resolution here, we have down to I got you. about a tenth of a parsec, and these clouds are about two parsecs each in size, so we're, we're pretty well sampling the clouds. I've actually smoothed the Argus data a little bit here just by a factor of two, so the resolution on here is down to maybe a fifth of a parsec, but we still have five beams, or ten beams across each cloud. Okay. So ultra compacts, even at that distance, are possible. Could be. Um, you, yeah, I don't know what, what an ultra compact region would look like with Argus. You would see molecular gas. Yeah, they, they, they would shoot they would be right into a point like that, almost point like with Mustang, right? Yeah, so if we're detecting them with Mustang, we should be able to detect them with Argus too. That might be a good complementary project with that MGPS survey where we look at those whatever ultra-compact H2 regions we find with Mustang, maybe we follow them up with Argus or follow a subset up. Yeah. In the beginning of your talk, um, you showed how uh, something was missed because the armor that, you know, the spiral arm was not in the galactic plane. I didn't quite understand that. Yeah, so the, the origin of the galactic warp isn't entirely understood. But normally we think of the galaxy as sort of pancake shaped. But in one part it warps above and on the exact opposite side it warps below. You can get that through a couple of different mechanisms. One could be that you have interactions with other galaxies. Basically makes a ripple and you see the strange warping. I think what's more likely is that it's driven by the galactic bar. So. 
trying to find a cartoon here. So the Milky Way has a pretty strong galactic bar. That's this linear feature of star formation where the spiral arms come off the edges in general. Um, they're not entirely perfectly coming off the edges of the bar. But we have this linear feature, and something like 60% of spiral galaxies also have this bar. So it could be that the bar is driving instabilities in the disk and making that ripple. So whereas this arm bends above the plane, star formation over here actually bends below the plane. So this is something that Ron Allen thought that he could be sensitive to, where he's looking basically out in this region and potentially seeing some of the warp of the disk out there from last week's talk. Uh, just to follow up out of curiosity, in terms of local group or where M31 is with respect to the year, the year OSC, you know, the orientation of the Milky Way with respect to where M31 or where the other local group galaxies are on the outer part. Are you talking about warping? Yeah, I mean, um, could you say it's but I think it's mostly due to the bar, but I was just curious what, yeah, I don't, what's I, out of that direction. <laughs> I don't think, oh, in, in this direction of yeah. the bar, I'm not sure what's at okay. those longitudes. M31 is a second quotient object. Okay, I didn't know. Okay. And that would be dumb. Oh, you're talking about interactions driving yeah, the bar. Yeah, I meant just local group interactions. Yeah. I think it, what would be more likely would be sort of dwarf galaxy interactions. I, it could be driven by something larger. I think the prevailing thought is that it's a bar instability. That makes sense. Problem. So you gave some tantalizing byproducts of these, these surveys, one of which is things like the uh, variation of X factors across the galaxy, um, uh, density of star formed of black and gas and flood across the galaxy, metallicities. Um, I know you didn't have time to talk about all those things, right? Are, are, is the project making progress on those other topics as well, or are you sort of still collecting the data to get to the point where you can start to making uh, advances on these other things. So on metallicity, yes, uh, we've made a bit of progress on that. There's another paper published this year using the H2 region surveys, and we will again have another one probably in, within two years that's also incorporating all of the southern surveys. What these do is they mostly take line ratios and predict a metallicity for each H2 region that way, you have to have pretty strong ratios, though to say much with certainty, and then they will try to interpolate across the rest of the galaxy. But if you are very incomplete in the southern hemisphere, for instance, it, it throws off your results. So you can say a lot about the first and second quadrants and not much about the third and fourth. That will hopefully be fixed in the next so you're year. So you're trying not only to do radial, you're also trying to do as lethal? Yeah, different sorts in, in metallicities. Okay. Yeah, and so you can see some features that might line up with spiral features, for instance, where you're seeing higher metallicity within spiral features, um, so at different longitudes, and not just moving out from the center of the galaxy. The X factor is a harder problem. So Alberto Bellotto has been working a lot on X factor type stuff, and Tom Dane recently has been trying to understand the x-factor of HCN. He thinks that our estimates basically have been historically off by a factor of five or so. There's actually a lot more HCN out there than we know of. So we'll see where that work goes in the, in the future. He has a lot larger sample of molecular gas clouds across the galaxy though. Yeah, we're pushing towards now doing astrophysics with these large surveys, whereas it's been, to some extent, stamp collecting for the past decade, where we just want to find how many regions we have. Now we're starting to really push into the physics of gal galactic star formation. <clears throat> so what fraction of uh, the missing H2 regions do you think are just faint you haven't seen yet versus parts of the galaxy you haven't searched. So the, very well. up. So I have some backup slides on this. Let's see. I think this one's fine. So with the VLA looking at 
150 of these radio quiet H2 regions. We detected 50% in just four minute integrations. If we go a little bit deeper, we detect, like if we triple that time, we detect 30% more beyond that. So it's likely that these all have radio continuum associated with them. It's just fainter than galactic plane surveys to date. And so with these observations, we've sort of set a stellar type limit on the type of star that can produce an H2 region with the same characteristic infrared and radio morphology of around B2. So we're looking at something like six times the mass of the sun. I think it's very likely that all of these H2, or all of these radio quiet candidates are H2 regions. They're just lower mass stars. So that really, that adds to uh, the number of H2 regions that we have in the WISE catalog, but have not been able to confirm. So pushing us towards that 10,000 number. Does that answer what you were asking? Yep. Any other questions? Um, so for your HCN and HCO plus, uh, since those are dense gas tracers, do you have to worry about them being optically thick? Like you're only seeing surface of it, or can you actually, um, like have you taken into account the fact that they could be optically thick? We haven't taken that into account, but if they are dense enough regions, then sure, they should be. Okay. Well, Come out of an outer galaxy maser emission, any attempts to look for water masers? Yes, there is one. And let's point it out on here. Keep coming back to this plot. So in 2017, there was a science paper about an H2 region right there, about seven degrees longitude, that had a maser detected through VLBI, put it right in the expected distance of the outer Scutum Centaurus arm. And whenever we compared the distance that we predicted for that region from kinematics, it put it at about the same place within a factor of say Has anyone done a directed survey toward these star forming regions? No, no. I mean, many of them should have masers right. coincident with them, but we haven't done anything except for that one object that was detected. And so that's the most distant maser observation in the Milky Way, but probably not the most distant source, even in that arm. So we could theoretically do a survey of some of these. Yeah, I'm just saying it's, more it's, it's, not an easier, it's not an easier way to detect these H2 regions is by looking for their maser emission. No, but it would be a, a way to better state their distances. The questions? Yeah, I think I'll speak Great, thank you.